Buenos tardes, compas. Good afternoon, colleagues. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our fall 2021 Boston University School of Social Work E&I Speaker Series event, co-sponsored with our macro department. Resisting Neoliberalism, Critical Reflections from Latin American Social Work with Melissa Campaña Alba Arce and Janina Munoz Arce. My name is Dawn Belkin Martinez, and I am the Associate Dean of Equity and Inclusion and co chair, along with Ellen DeVoe, of our BU SSW EI Committee, which includes all of our stakeholders faculty, staff, students, administrators, and alum. The committee has been around for many years, engaging in the work of building equity, inclusion, and justice here at BU SSW, as well as amplifying social justice focused activities here in the community. Some of the work we've engaged in includes organizing social justice learning communities, creating social justice focused case consultations, partnering with different departments around social justice focused interventions, student support and solidarity circles, and a field department social justice seminar. We have also have a wonderful resource page available to anyone, you don't have to be affiliated with BU, anyone that includes podcasts, peer reviewed literature, media articles that I encourage everybody to check out. Finally, we've just completed a three hour online module on structural and institutional racism that's available right now to anyone that has a BU password. And our hope is to make it available to everyone in the near future. You can access many of our resources at our ENI webpage. Before I introduce our moderator for tonight's presentation, Dean of the Boston University School of Social Work, Jorge Delva, I would like to review a few Zoom housekeeping items. Anyone who is receiving CEUs will need to keep their camera on during the entire session. If you're not receiving CEUs, we recommend turning off your camera during um, Melissa and um, Janina's talk. If you are receiving CEUs, you will need to complete the evaluation form and Lauren will type the, eval the link to the evaluation form in the chat at the end of the presentation. We suggest having your Zoom setting on speakers view so you, you can be focused on the speakers. We will be recording the presentation. So if you aren't comfortable being recorded and you aren't receiving CEUs, please keep your camera off during the entire event. We will be posting the recording on our ENI speaker series page a few days after the talk. All participants will be muted during the presentation. We recommend not using the chat during Mel and Janina's presentation as that can be distracting for the speaker. <clears throat> There's closed captioning is available for this presentation. To use closed captions, you need to click on the closed caption button and choose show subtitles for the categories to overlay on the screen. Finally, it goes without saying that all comments in the chat should be respectful and mindful of our entire Boston University School of Social Work community. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, Nuestro Querido Dean of the BU School of Social Work, Dr. Jorge Delva. Muchas gracias, Don. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be able to moderate today's presentation. I'm going to briefly review our format. I will introduce Melissa and Janina and they will each present for about 25 minutes. We will then have two members of our BU School of Social Work community offer a one minute reflection uh, about the talk. And actually it's gonna be 
one member, because one person, we had a big storm, is unavailable to join us, and one member from the University of Washington community who will also uh, be reflecting after the talk with Melissa and Janina. Finally, we will be able to answer a few questions from our audience that you can type into the chat. But before we start, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement reminds us all that colonization is an enduring reality and the Boston University sits on the traditional land of the Massachusetts people. If you are outside of Boston, take some time to learn about the tribal lands where you live and the ongoing movements to have land honored, acknowledged, and returned. This past year has been a year like no other, this past couple of years, with COVID-19 unmasking the devastating long-term effects of structural racism, neoliberalism, and gender inequality, the timing of Melissa and Janina's presentations couldn't be more appropriate for our historical moment, where we as social workers, part of our world community, stand at a crossroad. Social workers in Latin America have a long history of working in partnership with communities in the movement for social justice. Emerging from the shadows of neoliberalism, individuals, families, and grassroots organizations are joining together to create new social forces and communities of care. Today's presentations aim to provide an overview of the role of social workers in the struggle for feminism and abortion rights in Argentina and a new constitution in Chile. What are the factors that influence these successful movements and what are the opportunities for social workers here in the United States? Our first speaker tonight, Dr. Melissa Campana Albarce, currently works as an associate researcher at the National Council of Scientific and Technical Research and as a principal professor at the School of Social Work at the National University of Rosario, both in Argentina. She leads the Research Center in Governmentality and State and is a member of the Argentine Welfare Research Network. She is also editor-in-chief of the Catedra Paralela Journal. Her research and teaching activity during the last decades have focused on social work, social policy, welfare, government of the poor, and neoliberalism. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Campana Albarza. Thank you very much for this presentation. I'm very excited, but I'm very nervous as well. Well, we will, we'll be talking about this uh, before. And fortunately, I'm speaking first because my English is not as good as Janina's. So then you can, uh, enjoy a good English. Here I'm doing my best and I will share my screen here to start the Can you see the slides? Yes. You're good now. Okay. No here. So uh, first of all, I really like to thank the Boston School of Social Work and especially our dear colleague Don for this invitation. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure, even though we are, I'm, we are very nervous both with Janina. And as uh, Jorge had said, uh, before. Uh, we are living such a convulsive times. And I think that the pandemic has brought consequences of all kinds that will take years for us to diagnose, to completely, completely diagnose. But I think there are at least two immediate effects. One, interrupting popular mobilizations, and two, make it make invisible the fragrant inequalities on which our societies are built. In this context, I think the question of critique and resistance becomes urgent. Among other reasons, because it is urgent that the day after the streets 
once again become the stage for popular struggles. And that these fundamental inequalities remain visible. And that is why my presentation is entitled Legal, Safe and Free Abortion in Argentina, the ending point of a long feminist struggle. Just to mention some basic conceptual considerations, let's start by saying something we all know here, that social representations of gender are built on the ideas of what men should be and what women should be, which in our society are crystallized in stereotypes and roles that produce and reinforce binary thinking. Sexism, homo, lesbo, transbiphobia, and heterosexuality as a mandatory and naturalized norm are part of this symbolic world and have an impact on social life in different ways. For instance, and I think it is important for social workers, we must never forget the fact that public policies are, are gendered. That is to say that all the contents, objectives, and methodologies of state actions are imbued with conceptions of the relative value of male and female cultural attributes. In this sense, we can speak of political frameworks. This is a concept built by Judith Butler that I really like and refers to how those frames operate to differentiate the lives we can apprehend from those we cannot. Those frames, those political frameworks, generate specific ontologies of the subject, which are manifested in such naturalized expressions like first and second class citizens. These normative conditions establish no less than who will and who will not be recognized as a subject in our societies. For that reason, if we want to remain our horizons of critique and resistance, I really think we must disrupt those political frameworks. And it's not only a matter of how to include more people within the already existing norms, but to consider how the already existing norms assign recognition in a differential way and fight to alter them. I'm convinced that both the constitutional reform in Chile and the legalization of abortion in Argentina are extremely good examples of actually dislocate the previous social order. Since 2020, abortion in Argentina is legal on demand in the first 14 weeks of gestation. Prior to 2020, a 1921, remember that date, a 1921 law regulated access to and penalties for abortion. Any woman that intentionally caused her own abortion or consented to another person performing one on her was faced with one to four years of prison. However, abortion could be performed legally by a certified doctor if one, it had been made to avoid a threat to the life or health of the woman, and two, if the pregnancy was a result of a rape or an indecent assault against a mentally disabled woman. There is a body of regular regulatory history between 1921 and 2020, of course, but the most relevant of these happened during the last decade. You can see in the slide the, the movement, the evolution of regulations. In 2012, 
The Supreme Court of Justice establishes that any woman victim of sexual abuse may terminate her pregnancy without previous judicial authorization and without fear of subsequent criminal charges. The decision also exonerates any doctor exec executing the procedure. In 2015, based on that decision, the National Ministry of Health developed the protocol for the comprehensive care of people with right to legally terminate a pregnancy. In Spanish, is Protocolo ILE. And finally, in 2020, we have the law for voluntary termination or interruption of pregnancy. In Spanish, is known as IVE. It's important to say that many failed abortions attempts and death due to them are not recorded as such and or are not notified to the authorities because it was illegal. Some cases have been really paradigmatic, but I only uh, will mention one of them. Happened in 2003. An 18 year old rape victim called Romina Tejerina from Jujuy had a baby in secret and killed her, according to tests in a psychotic, psychotic episode. Two years later, she was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Townspeople, public figures, and some politicians expressed her support to Tejerina as a victim and many pointed out that she should have had the chance to restore to abortion. Most notably, the sentence prompted health minister to state his support for legal abortion for rape victims, as I said before. Fortunately, there are multiple non-governmental organizations providing women with help to access drugs that can interrupt pregnancies as well as doctors who openly perform the procedure. But at the same time, the anti-abortion movement has lobbied against the legalization of abortion and has threatened to take the new abortion law to court. They are already doing that. Argentina has a robust network of women's organizations whose demands include public access to abortion and contraception. The history of the right to terminate a pregnancy begins in 1986. As I said before, there is a body of normative history between 1921 and 2020, but the most relevant of these took place during the last decade. In the same way, there is a lot of feminist activism and work from the 60s to nowadays. But I'm going to focus on the last two decades. I have done the slides just to split them. Mel, Mel, before you go on, would you be able to press the desk icon to make it larger so people can? Si Sorry, puedes ver, I... poner pantalla, si puedes poner pantalla completa abajito donde está el porcentaje que se ve el proyector completo para que la gente pueda leer. Let me see. Here. No, no, no. No, más hacia, hacia, eh, no al 80, ahí, eso. <laughs> eso, uh, ahí. Thank you. Ay, sorry. Now. Sorry, I didn't get it. Thank you for, for warning me. So in 2002, the Assembly for the Right to Abortion was confirmed. And in 2004, it was the first national meeting for the right to legal, safe, and free abortion in Buenos Aires. One year later, 
the national campaign to the right of legal abortion, so-called the campaign, la campaña, eh, es conocida como la campaña en español, was created. The campaign is a crucial collective actor. It formally introduced bills to decriminalize and legalize abortion in multiple locations, as you can see in the slides, under the motto or the hashtag, que sea ley, let it be law. Banners, graffiti, and this green bandana are icons of this struggle. Despite the fact that the legal proposals did not manage to advance in the Congress until 2020. In 2015, ni una menos, no one less, emerged. This huge movement began as a Twitter campaign against gender violence that used the hashtag ni una menos. The first spontaneous march came on June the 3rd that year in reaction to the murder of a 14-year-old Chiara Paez who was found buried in her boyfriend's backyard after being beaten to death and a few months pregnant. The following year, Argentinian feminists held a mass strike in response to the rape and murder of 16-year-old Lucia Perez in Mar del Plata. We can say that Ni Una Menos was like a fuse for the green tide that manifested itself in June 2018. That year, the project to legalize the voluntary termination of a pregnancy is presented to Congress. It obtains more than half the vote in deputies, but then is rejected by senators. This introduction of the bill triggered an unprecedented process. Newspapers, television shows, online social networks show the debate for months, while the informational session, sessions at National Congress. The parliamentary debate was particularly heated, as were the preparatory sessions. From the latter, I recommend two short videos, then I will uh, share these links in the chat so you can hear it properly. But those videos are, are really paradigmatic from two of the most relevant intellectuals and activists for abortion rights, Dora Barrancos and Alicia Stolkiner. Both were called as expert speakers in favor of the law. Finally, in 2020, as a product of the relentless struggle of women's movements, which took the streets for decades, Argentina's president, Alberto Fernandez, announced that he sent the project of legally terminating a pregnancy to the National Congress once again. The project was approved and now women who decide to terminate their pregnancy can choose to do it in a legal, safe, and free way within the health system. It's interesting to comment that together with that law, another project called Comprehensive Care and Health Treatment During Pregnancy and Early Childhood, known as Plan for the 1000 Days, El Plan de los Mil Días, was also approved by the Congress. And it includes care and support for maternity and the first three years of life. Thus, Argentina has become the first big country in Latin America to move forward toward the legality of women's reproductive rights in the region. And safe, legal, and free abortion, it's now a law, it's a law. In closing, I want to return to the ideas of Judith Butler and her invitation to pay attention to the corporeality and materiality of bodies. You can see there in the pictures, so many bodies together. Not as passive containers, but as spaces of contestation and continuous political exercise. I bring here a quote that I really love 
from from Butler. It says, if what I want is only produced in relation to what is wanted of me, then the idea of my own desire is inappropriate. I am in my desire, desire negotiating what is wanted of me. I like this quote because that negotiation is struggle. It is politics. It is never destiny. That negotiation is the core of our struggles, I think. What lies at the heart of the anti-right movements is, as Dora Barrancos always says, the patriarchal feeling that women have no right to sexual freedom and pleasure. In the compulsory nature of childbearing, there is an escalation that ends in the blocking of women's sexual freedom. That is what is unbearable, the freedom to escape from the mandate of motherhood. Pregnancy is, in 80% of the cases, a contingency. Heterosexual people who have intercourse are generally not thinking of reproducing. Of course, there is planning and purpose, but that is not the norm. A contingency then cannot become a compulsion with enormous consequences for women. Democracy owes us the democratization of sexuality. There is no heterosexual transaction that for a woman does not contain the phantasmatic threatening shadow of the pregnancy that she does not seek. So what is the place, the possibility, the modalities, the alliances for an anti-neoliberal and feminist resistance nowadays? Again, as Butler says, when bodies congregate in any public space, they are exercising a plural and performing right to appearance, a right that affirms and installs the body in the midst of the political field, and that claims for the body economic, social, and political conditions that make life more dignified, more livable. The power of this materiality, like these pictures, is immense. We don't have to invent everything. Many bodies have already offered themselves in this struggle. We only need to recover their legacies, their banners, and fight like a woman. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Melissa. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Um, what an extraordinary presentation and uh, in all, at all levels, but I appreciated the historical context you provided for us outside of Argentina to better understand the struggle. Thank you. Just as a reminder to everyone, um, the uh, questions and reflections will occur after the next presentation. So we'll be able to return to uh, return to uh, Melissa's amazing presentation. Um, so now I have the pleasure of introducing the Dr. Janina Muñoz Arce, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work at the University of Chile. She is the coordinator of the Interdisciplinary Studies in Social Work Research Cluster and the editor-in-chief of the journal Propuestas Críticas en Trabajo Social, Critical Proposals in Social Work Journal. Her current and past research grants include professional resistances in frontline implementation of social programs, a longitudinal study of research trajectories of social workers, and interprofessional practices in integrated social service. In addition to her publications in Spanish, she has recently published in the British Journal of Social Work, the European Journal of Social Work, and Critical Social Policy. She's a member of the Chilean Social Work Research Network, as well as the Social Work Action Network. It is my pleasure to introduce Janina. 
Thank you very much, Jorge. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Don, and the Boston University School of Social Work, the team, the complete team. I'm very happy to be invited to present here. Um, and I was very happy with Melissa's uh, presentation because uh, this is feminist struggle in our countries is something very important. We have a very conservative uh, umbrella, no? a context, I mean, where this kind of struggles are developing. And Argentina is an example for Chile as well. We, we are in the, in the same way, hopefully. So thank you very much. Um, let me share the screen in that way. Um, what I want to present for you today is something related to a political uh, struggle we are living in my country. Um, uh, um, two years ago, uh, a, a movement called uh, 18 of October movement um, was a political struggle uprising uh, uh, with, with a lot of riots and, and political violence from the state to repress uh, the protests. Um, that, 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 uh, that, political, uh, that political movement created an environment in which social workers have um, a, a, a role to play. Uh, and what I was studying at that time was how social workers can exert professional resistance. So this is, is a concept that I, I would like to, to introduce in this presentation. Um, so what I want to present today is, is something related to that context and how nowadays, in the uh, political constitutional uh, change we are living, how social workers are participating and, and what are the challenges in, in this context. So um, to start, I need to let you know something about the historical context, because the movement of the 18th of October, last, uh, two years ago, is a result of something more, how can I say, deep in our political history. As you may know, uh, more than 40 years ago, we had a dictatorship, a very long and, and, and violent dictatorship, as in other countries in Latin America. Uh, but the dictatorship of uh, Augusto Pinochet in, in Chile was very long, six, 17 uh, years of political repression, uh, violence, uh, violation of human rights, even intellectual censorship. Uh, for example, I, I, I can tell you that uh, schools of social work, all the books, uh, social work books, dissertations and documents were burned as part of uh, censorship of, of the critical uh, thought that the schools of social work have at that time. No? So, in terms of politically speaking and culturally speaking, the, the, the dictatorship was very important in, in, in our, in our uh, history, but not also in that terms. It was also important because uh, it, it, it permitted the installation of the neoliberal model, uh, the neoliberal experiment, as, as David Harvey says, uh, an experiment that was uh, produced uh, uh, thanks to the political law, the political constitution uh, created during the dictatorship that enabled the, the, the creation of many other laws and, and, and the functioning of the market and so on. So the economic model have this background now. 40 years later, uh, the inequality gaps in, in all the all domains of life, in gender, in, in distribution of wealth, uh, in access to social services, health, education, housing, the pension system. So I, I don't have time to explain all the domains of life in which neoliberal neoliberalism has a, a very important effect. So after this decades, uh, movements started to grow up. And we have, I, I, I can say, maybe 10 years of different movement, student movement, the feminist movement, uh, the pension uh, movement. But what happened two years ago, exactly two years ago, was, um, how can I say, an articulation of all the demands 
all the anger, all the, um, um, all the needs of different uh, sectors of, of the Chilean society that started because uh, an increasing in the price of the subway, you now the public transportation, but rapidly, very, very quickly, it started to um, include other dimensions. And at the end, the, the, the main questioning was inequality, the inequality produced by uh, the neoliberal model. And of course, uh, reproduces rep reproduced by the uh, political constitution so at the end uh, the main demand was create a new political constitution for the country the um, protest took place in different cities of chile from north to south even in rural areas, which is very particular in our story history, uh, that that's not so common. Um, and, and well, <laughs> it was very massive uh, protest at that time, and a lot of political violence against people uh, protesting in the streets. So we had again, as in the dictatorship, uh, human rights violation, people killed people who lost their eyes because of the police forces um, used, this, used the strategy to shot uh, towards the eyes of people in, in the demonstrations. So it was very, it was very sad at the same time than that an emotional time because um, we knew that the main problem was the political constitution. However, it was so violent. So it was a very difficult time. Four months from October to February, I think, because in March, the pandemic, as Melissa said, um, came to uh, decrease in some point uh, demonstrations, not uh, finishing the demonstrations, but uh, they decrease, of course, because of the health uh, situation. Um, and then we, we have a, a plebiscite to decide uh, the, the possibility of change our constitution. And with 80% of, of the votes, we elected to uh, create a new, a new political constitution, which is, uh, this is occurring now uh, in, in this year. Well, this, that's the context. <laughs> I'm trying to explain a, a very complex context in, in, in this minute. So I hope you, you may understand. But the point is, my question was, how social workers in this very uh, active, confusing and uh, emotional and, and, and repressive context, how social workers uh, face this moment, how they address their practices, are they resisting in some point uh, this uh, kind of uh, neoliberalism, and also the struggles, how they join the, the, the political change. So with my uh, research team, we have uh, many questions about uh, how, how social workers can engage in, in this political dimension of social life. Because in previous uh, studies, we, we discovered that we have a kind of split, a division between our political life political life after 6 p.m. <laughs> on the weekends, and our, um, how can I say, our job uh, without politics at all, uh, as, as we can be ne neutral in, in, in terms of politics. So we have this, this kind of two souls, no? The question was, is this movement, the 18th of October movement, changing that kind of uh, approach in, in our political dimension as social workers? Well, the concept we used was the concept of uh, professional resistances. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain in detail uh, th this, this concept now, um, but I can say this is a, a, a very important element in critical social work because it means that we as social workers can contest, can challenge the uh, uh, frameworks, the guidelines, the institutional frameworks in general in which we work. 
So from this per perspective, we are not uh, only implementers or workers that obey rules, but we are able to change, to modify, to adapt, to even uh, omit, yeah, skip some rules in order to uh, create more well-being uh, in, in, in service users, for example, because we think it, it's, it's very politically motivated, the idea of professional resistances that we use because uh, we resist in our frontline practice. So we change or we, we omit some information uh, when we think that the policies or, or the frameworks are unjust or are inappropriate. So it's, it, it's, it's very, it's related to an ethical and political project you know, uh, that, that, social work, that social workers have eventually. So, well, there are many types of resistances, but I, I, I cannot uh, explain this now, but if you want, I can recommend something uh, to read more about this. Uh, the point is how how social workers, um, if if at all, <laughs> if they exert professional resistances in, in in the context of the 18th of October movement, and we found four types of professional resistance. Um, so I I, I will present uh, this. The first one was uh, something very simple. The idea of occup occupy, occupying the streets, to, I, I mean, being in the streets, uh, going outside the offices. So perhaps you can say, but is that resistance? In the context of Chile, which is very, um, how can I say, it's vertical, uh, the, 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 the organization of social services, uh, yes, it, it, it's, very, uh, it's, it's a very challenging uh, attitude to say, Today, I'm not going to work uh, inside or within the office. I want to go outside. I want to go to the streets. So uh, for example, some of them, some social workers uh, went to the protest. Others uh, organized cabildos. Cabildos means a kind of community um, meeting uh, in which a reflection, a critical reflection about the protests, the, the, the political constitution, political violence, all, all these um, reflections about the moment we were living were produced. So they, um, they decided not to continue the common, the routine in their work and going to organize cabildos in schools, in community centers, uh, hospitals, churches, and so on. And another kind of resistance, um, for example, uh, one, in one interview, we, said, uh, we have some, someone who said, I said no. Said, saying no <laughs> is, is something also very important in our, in our culture, in, in our context. We are not uh, accustomed, we, are not, we, we don't use to say no to managers or bosses, you know? So uh, this in this situation was uh, because the, the managers asked her to go to the metro, the subway, to clean uh, the disaster um, that was made by the, the protesters um, as a kind of voluntary action. Uh, and she said, the social worker, she said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to organize a gabildo. I'm going to organize a Oya Común, which I, I don't know how I, I can translate that. Oya Común means like common pot, where uh, like a food bank, where people share food um, in, in community. So saying no was a, a very important resistance in, in, in our context. Well, the second is uh, how the discourses of political, or, sorry, how the discourses of professional organizations of social work in Chile were uh, politicized. Because um, before this movement, um, organizations of, of social work, professional organizations were always, uh, how can I say, they avoided conflict, 
they avoided to have a, a, um, a direct political position. But in, in, after this movement, uh, the, the discourses changed and, and, and were more focused on uh, criticizing structural mechanisms that produce inequality, uh, that produce that individuals uh, suffer in, in, in neoliberalism. Uh, professional organizations were able to name, to say it is neoliberalism. It's not people's problem or poverty uh, that individuals uh, live because they don't work and, and so on. That conservative approach um, was displaced, but a very critical uh, approach on, on, on structural mechanisms. Uh, this is a, something uh, inedit, I can say, unusual, unusual, <laughs> or something like that. And the third, and this is very interesting. I invite you also to, to check it out in Facebook. Uh, find out more uh, about this uh, initiative because students, social work students and um, academics from universities, they created a commission, like a, co a committee, I can say, a very informal organization to interview people who was a uh, victim of political violence in the context of the protests. So they uh, transcribe, tra transcribed the testimonies and then they created infographs. I, I don't know if I can say infographias, <laughs> infograph to share in social network. So that's is the fourth uh, type of resistance. A kind of performative resistance, or in the literature, you can find this like e resistance, electronic resistance, using social networks uh, to disseminate how human rights were violated in that context. For example, a group of students they created a comic. Uh, I, I put this picture here so you can, well, it, it is in Spanish, but perhaps you can something you can understand because. It is about how in the protest people were playing music and a kind of celebration uh, in the streets, but then the repression uh, by the, poli the police force uh, started and someone lost an eye. As I, I told you before, um, the loss of eyes was something very common and, uh, in that uh, period. You can find out more about these comics and infograph and all the work of uh, dissemina dissemination of uh, human rights violations in social networks. Um, and this is um, perhaps there are simple actions, but um, are important, are relevant for social work in Chile because. Um, as I said before, it is a very conservative, or, or it was, it was a very conservative social work uh, after the dictatorship, after the intellectual censorship. Um, many social workers were disappeared, were killed during the Pinochet dictatorship more than 40 years ago. So fear, and yeah, especially fear against um, authority and and this vertical culture, you know, made very difficult that social workers were involved in political action before the 18th of October movement. And something has, has started to move, I think. We are still studying this uh, process. Uh, um, in fact, we are, we are the, 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 the protests are starting again now that the COVID-19, the coronavirus has not stopped, but at least the, the cases ha have decreased. Uh, more, more protests in the streets are taking uh, place. So we, we don't know how, how this uh, story will finish, but at the moment I can say social workers are resisting, in, but in a very creative way, perhaps they are not struggling in the street. Many of them are still working in community centers, doing cabildos, or using social networks to disseminate and, and raise uh, political awareness. It, it is, uh, we, don't, we have, I, I, I want to say, we have different strategies to exert resistance. Um, 
So it is, it's a work in progress. Uh, well, and, and the point is that now we have the, the, the political constitution process, the new political constitution. So this is very, for me, it's amazing and emotional because it's the first constitution with gender parity in the world. For a society like the Chilean society is something uh, unprecedented. I, I can say we never thought that this could be possible, and it, it, it is related with uh, feminist movements, as Melissa said in, in her presentation, and and with all the the, the demands that these uh, movements ha have uh, put in, in in the last years. And for example, we have reserved seats for indigenous people. This is not the first uh, constitution in the world that had this, but for us, it's also very important because Chile is a very racist. Uh, country uh, with a coloniality, a, a colonial yes, a, a colonial a perspective of of race uh, nowadays. So it's, it's 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 like something very hopeful, no? I, and we have four social workers uh, who were elected as constituyentes, the people who will create the new constitution, which is uh, a, 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 an important uh, number. Um, and we also, from our research network in social work, in created conferences and policy brief uh, to contribute to the debates of, of the, uh, the constitution. Um, this is a kind of effort, a gesture to connect what we do in academia with the political process. So the question was how we can offer, uh, contribute with our research to this uh, new political uh, law we are creating. So it, it's an effort. It's also a working process, I, I have to say. And yes, well, we have a lot of challenges to face. And I think we still have the challenge to disseminate and analyze our practices of resistance um, and, of course, articulate social work professional organizations with academia with move uh, students movements so we, we still are trying we are exercising a kind of collective resistance but i'm afraid it is the, the main kind of resistance is still individual or very micro resistance well but 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 for our context is something uh, important anyway so i think it must be uh, highlighted in, in in if we consider our history of dictatorship and political trauma finally so thank you very much for for uh, listening to this presentation uh, and i hope you understand and understood my english uh, we are trying to do our best as, as meli said before muchas gracias janina tal como melissa una presentación excelente y el inglés de las dos perfecto se extendió todo 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 um, i also want gracias, to say, jorge sí se pasaron se pasaron uh, I appreciate the, also your historical context, just as Melissa did, and the various models of resistance that you presented. So now I'd like to introduce our first reflector, Catalina Tan Yan. Catalina was born and raised in Colombia by her immigrant parents for, from Southern China. She's a doctoral student here at Boston University School of Social Work. Her research focuses on how critical youth and community-based participatory action research approaches can create equitable social policy and settling pedagogy and applied research. Catalina will uh, start a conversation with Mel and Janina. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Thank you so much, Jorge. Um, this is a bilingual message. So, primero que todo, muchísimas gracias por esa generosidad de compartir su recorrido, su trabajo tan espectacular. So thank you so much, first of all, for sharing with us your journey and such a fabulous and spectacular work. Um, primero voy a compartir unas reflexiones por mi parte y luego tengo una preguntita que quiero invitarles a reflexionar con, la, con el público. So I have, uh, I'm gonna share a reflection first. 
uh, about what I heard from both of you. And then I'm going to uh, invite you both to reflect on a question with the audience. Hay tres temas que resaltaron para mí eh, en ambas presentaciones que fueron muy impactantes y transformadoras. Y la primera fue que tiene eh, un recorrido histórico crítico eh, y realza mucho la parte legislativa, sociopolítica y económica de todos esos procesos tan importantes. So the first part is really uh, this theme around highlighting the critical piece of the historical overview documenting key legislative, sociopolitical and economic processes for both topics. Y el segundo tema en común que también resonó bastante fue eh, cómo se realzó esos esfuerzos colectivos de resistencia y de lucha para reivindicar esos espacios en contra o al subalternos para redefinir los cuerpos, la sexualidad, eh, la participación política y, y el trabajo del, um, social. And the second theme really focused also around this highlight around resistance and collective struggle to claim counter spaces of defining bodies Redefining body, sexuality, political participation, social work practice. Y la última eh, se enfocó bastante, enfatizaron bastante esta idea de, de cómo estamos desafiando estos, estas narrativas hegemónicas, no solamente a través de los discursos, pero a través de las acciones y cómo estamos en relación los unos con los otros. And the last one is about this counter um, spaces and the ways that we challenge hegemonic rhetoric, not only with words, but also with actions and the ways that we are in relationships with each other. Entonces sabemos que el trabajo social es, es, un, es un área de, de una lucha continua y con el incremento de estas políticas neoliberales, coloniales y raciales de la profesión. Eh, y también esta profesión está ubicada en una manera muy única porque tiene un compromiso muy importante con la justicia social. Eh, entonces, pensando desde sus vivencias, su recorrido, su trabajo, quería invitarles y preguntarles si podían compartir sus reflexiones sobre cómo podemos eh, sostener eh, estos, estos esfuerzos, es, esta lucha, como dice eh, la doctora eh, Melissa Campana, alabarse en su artículo en las trincheras, ¿no? So, I think... Critical social work is an arena of continuous struggle uh, that we're constantly contesting with increasing neoliberal settler colonial and racialized policies of the profession. And one of the unique ways the profession is situated uh, in contrast with other professions is its commitment with social justice and its mission and its values. So drawing from your lived experiences, your journeys, the work that you've done, what are some of your reflections and thoughts about um, how to sustain these sort of commitments and struggles in the trenches? of our work. May we say something about that? <laughs> okay, I'll try. <laughs> I try. I try first because of my English. Um, I, I really would like to have a kind of recite to, to give you, to share with you about uh, how to do uh, an effective resistance, but unfortunately or not, I don't have it. But I really think, of course, the things that I, I wrote in that article and others, I think that as Shanina pointed, by saying no to some practices that are oppressive or that reinforce inequalities by uh, highlighting that kind of practices, mostly because uh, social workers used to work in frontline uh, in, uh, institutions. So we have to deal with the problems, uh, not as uh, ideas, but as concrete problems every day with a with, uh, regular and material people they are asking for, for a solution, for help, whatever. So I, I think that, that micro practices are really important. But at the same time, I think 
and I'm convinced about this, that we, we mustn't try to be heroes. Uh, uh, I mean with this that to be resistance, we need to be in a collective organization. We need to be more than one, more than me, my voluntary and my body offering for the cause. Uh, we need to think in a collective way uh, in constructing bonds and solidarities and alliances with others, other actors, other professions, uh, other just citizens, regular citizens uh, fighting for their rights. Uh, and I think it's important. In Argentina, for instance, we have two national federations of social work. One regarding to regarding academic universe and one regarding to professional organizations. And both of the national organizations agree, uh, for example, in the case of abortion, agree that if we say, and we actually say, we defend human rights, so, well, we have to be on the street defending the right to abortion, to legal and safe abortion. Uh, it is consistent when our resistance and with our discourses about resistance that we must translate to our practices, our everyday practices. So I think that uh, the, the relevance of collective actors are crucial, uh, is crucial in this, in this sense. I don't know if I am clear with the idea. I think you are very clear. <laughs> yes, I, may I say something as well? Uh, I think neoliberalism may, may, makes very difficult to resist in a collective way because everything is organized to compete, to be individualistic, to apply for a scholarship, to apply for a grant, you know, everything. So it's very counter hegemonic. I don't know if I am pronouncing the word as, as <laughs> appropriate, but it's counter hegemonic to try to do something in a collective way, in, a, in, a, in solidarity, you know? Sometimes that kind of things are unpaid and it's your time. You are donating your time, your body, as Melissa said, you, to, to put something to the, to the common. It, it, it interpolates us to think about the idea of the common, which is common for us today and, and what we, do for uh, this idea of the common. And this is, is very difficult. Even in, in Chile, we had this uh, political struggle and people went to the streets. Even though we, in, in another study, we discovered that uh, precarity in labor conditions of social workers in, in Chile uh, is terrible. People, I, I, can, I can explain in detail here, but precarity affects all, all social workers. However, the solution is often individualistic. It's, I have to cope with this. I, I, I have to do something, but it's terrible because sometimes they don't ask or don't see that other colleagues are in the same position, are also very explo explo exploited and self-exploited in this system. So that is something, um, that in, in our country has been very difficult to, to, to change. Uh, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, it's like we have a, a double life, you know, the labor is always very uh, obedient. And in, in, in after, or after, after uh, work or I don't know, in free, free time, People is more critical. It's, it's something very strange. I, I, but so, yes, I agree with, with Mel. Uh, the, the, the big challenge is to articulate our efforts our, and, and create collective 
uh, collect, collective force. Uh, yeah, I think uh, an exchange to know what other people is, is doing for me has been very important to participate in uh, SWAN, Social Work Action Network, because you can see that there are other social workers in other countries struggling with something very similar and trying to do something. And this is, is really, really <laughs> amazing because we are not alone. I think this is the main, um, the main um, uh, idea of uh, to resist neoliberalism, to think we are not alone, where there are many people trying to contest this. Les agradezco sus respuestas tan profundas y gracias Catalina por la reflexión y la, 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 el resumen de los tres temas que ha resultado una conversación muy interesante. I'm thanking uh, the conversation, the, our panelists and Catalina's questions. I'd like to uh, invite now Dr. Roberto Orellana, who is a health disparities researcher conducting prevention research on the intersecting epidemics of trauma, HIV, COVID-19, and substance use with diverse populations in Peru, Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States. Dr. Orellana is a professor of social work at the University of Washington in Seattle. As he mentioned earlier, born and raised in Guatemala, he has also lived and worked in Peru, New York City. Sorry, he didn't mention earlier, that was an earlier conversation we had. <laughs> oh, I, uh, my time zone is getting mixed up. And Seattle. Uh, okay, enough about me, Roberto, please. Uh, we invite you to do your, your reflections. And I'm noticing, questions in the chat. I'm going to also write them down so later on we return to them. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jorge. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thanks for letting me crash the BU uh, party here. <laughs> Someone from Washington. Uh, you know, I'm, I've, I had lots of thoughts and, uh, and Catalina did such a good job. Uh, so, and she took some of my some of my ideas, which is great, but really I want to, again, reflect on the historical aspect of the movements in, in, in both of those countries and uh, in that role of neoliberalism, right? And how we, throughout the world, but keeping it here in the Americas, we all have experienced neoliberalism and the role of the governments and keeping that system going, right? And, and being, uh, victims of, of repression in different ways, being victims of violence expressed in different ways. And uh, so I was, uh, you know, I was uh, taken aback by, by, by again, by, by recognizing the, the violence, right, of, 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 of the Pinochet and, and the other dictatorships in Argentina and throughout the Americas, and how uh, that led to to a potential lack of engagement from some groups with reason because you don't wanna get killed, right? So that totally makes sense. And, and then, but at some point we get to a point in society where we can take it anymore, right? And that's where people take it to the streets. Uh, technology has, has helped in some parts of the resistance these days. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I was just thinking uh, in other parts of, of the world, we, we face that, that repression in, 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 in less explicit ways, right? So in some places you get tear gas, which is bad, but in other places you get shot in the face and that's super bad. So how do you resist in that context, right? And as we saw in the, in the Chile presentation, uh, for many years, social workers uh, may not have resisted, at least professionally, because of concerns about their jobs and their safety. And, uh, but then now, right, I, I'm going to ask a question now. I wonder if uh, new generations of social workers, right, not the ones that lived through the 70s and 80s, but the new generations, right? They know about it. They know about the trauma, but they're also young people, younger people, right? Who also are more uh, 
you know, have grown up with social networking and all that stuff, right? So that has led to other forms of resistance from new, new generations of social workers, right, in, throughout the world. And so the questions that I, I like to, to ask you to perhaps expand more is uh, from, from both countries, but uh, talking about that trauma, right, from the, from the older generation of social workers and how, how that has uh, been uh, dealt with in the profession, right? And what's the, the understanding of the newer generation as to what the older social workers face in the 70s and, and 80s. And, um, and one specific question about Chile, uh, you know, when they burn all the dissertations and all that and the thesis, has there been efforts to recover that? You know, in, in, in other areas of our work, we call that epistemicide, epistemicidio, right? El matar nuestros conocimientos. Entonces, si mataron esos conocimientos, obviamente en ese tiempo no lo teníamos en una computadora guardado, so it may be hard, but uh, hopefully there's some, uh, some ways to, to recover some of that knowledge. Y en Argentina, in Argentina, I wonder if... Uh, uh, doctora Campana podría hablar también un poco más sobre uh, el rol de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras sociales en ese movimiento relacionado con, con la resistencia profesional que nos habló la, la doctora Muñoz en esos movimientos de mujeres y la lucha de mujeres por todas esas décadas en Argentina. Las trabajadoras sociales participaron más como trabajadoras sociales o como mujeres. O sea, fuera la resistencia personal o la resistencia profesional, si hay alguna diferencia entre esas dos, o quizás no. Uh, I briefly ask at the end to, to talk, uh, uh, or the presenters to talk a little bit more about uh, the role of social workers, for example, in Argentina, and whether a lot of social workers who I believe the majority may be women participated in the struggle as social workers or as women or as both, or is there a, a, a division of that? And that question comes from the concept of professional resistance and whether a lot of the resistance is professional resistance, personal resistance, or we shouldn't even be thinking about those two things being different. At the end of the day, our bodies are body, whether we're social workers, women, men, we're all one. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think it's it's quite like you said, uh, you said, uh, Roberto, at the end of the day, we are just one, one person. <laughs> we are just the same. But uh, in the case of Argentina, we have a, a long political tradition of struggle, of uh, demonstrations, of uh, fighting and taking the streets and uh, protest against the yes the the i don't know where when our rights are threatened uh, right to education to public education right to public health because we have here a very strong tradition about public services and the term public here and social works almost only work in public ser services. We have no uh, private services, social services. And for, for instance, in health private sector, there's no social workers working there. So we are really commit with public sector. And that's why that difference between me, myself, or me as a social worker is very difficult to do because we're really committed with that. And because of that tradition, we also have a strong networks of a strong professional networks that in time are related to other networks like women next for networks, feminist networks, um, I don't know how to say uh, pueblos originarios networks. Indigenous people. In, okay. Uh, our uh, professional organizations are permanently related 
with uh, those other uh, networks. So we, we really have uh, this tradition in defending human rights. And I think it's, uh, it's also a, a heritage from dictatorship for the struggles to recover democracy. And, uh, for example, we're still looking for the grandchildren that were uh, appropriate during the, the last dictatorship and that they know, they don't know their real identity. They were taken from her parents and we are still looking for them. So we have uh, deep marks from that, uh, yes, mem from that memories, from that history. I, I use the, the word memory because here in Argentina, we say uh, política de la memoria, memory politics, uh, joining with the idea of human rights. When we say human rights here, we say memory. We say remember what happened during the, the horror uh, in the 70s, 80s. So I think it's impossible for us to do that a distinction between me, myself, and me as a social worker, and me as a feminist activist, it's, it's all messed there. Thank you. In Chile, it's the opposite that Meli has said. We, social workers, we work, 80% of us work in private services because as a consequence of the dictatorship, all the social services, education, health, everything was privatized. So we have a, a different situation. This is very interesting yeah. for you to think that Latin America is very diverse, that we said Latin America, but in Latin America there are many different stories and, and, and political environments. So yeah, in Chile is the opposite. So I think there are some authors that said that um, social work in Chile is so conservative or, or used to be before uh, October uh, 19. So conservative and, and with fear and so on because uh, the dictatorship of Pinochet was the bloodiest and the most violent dictatorship in Latin America and the longest as well. So it was, um, was difficult to reconstruct social work in Chile because of the censorship. When, when you, Roberto, said they burned dissertations, books of social work, we couldn't recover that. Uh, and this is part of our memory that was lost. And not also that, we always, uh, the schools of social work were closed during the 80s, during the dictatorship because they were considered uh, Marxist uh, schools. So they were closed, except the Catholic University School of Social Work because of the Vatican that uh, intercede. But then years later, when the schools of social work started to open again, they were depoliticized. I don't know if I pronounce it, without politics, you know? Only technical approach without a uh, political or ethical uh, reflection or theoretical, theoretical and, and philosophical uh, discussion. It was, uh, we, we call that um, um, technological social work, trabajo social tecnológico, because without approach. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, as you can be as a social worker in nowhere without any, any underpinning you know, of, of your approach. And, and that, um, have as a consequence that the yeah political action was very unusual, you know. And about a, a question that Joff, I don't know, I, I pronounce your name Joff, but you put something in the chat asking about cross generation generational exchange between uh, social workers. And this is a very interesting question. I think we can have another research in the future because the oldest. Uh, I mean, those social workers who leave the dictatorship as a students, they are brave in the streets, but social workers, 40 years old, 50, like me, I, I, I am 42 years old. Uh, 
they're more, um, how can I say, they, they feel more fear because we live the dictatorship, but also the democracy period, which was very depoliticized. So, but the youngest generations, they're very, very brave. In fact, when I, when I uh, was in, in, in the streets in October 19, I was very scared because they, for example, they um, contest the police in, in, a, in a very explicit way. And I, I said, they are going to be killed. So, you know, it is a very, a very important gap between generations, I think, and how we approach political change. But it's something that uh, we can uh, study more, I think. And, uh, and Michelle, thank you very much, Michelle, for the question about collective uh, bonds, uh, because it's, it is related with, with uh, Roberto's question I, as well, I think, because uh, in, in Chile, people who study social work, most of them are from working class sectors. So it was very, Extra, uh, rare that coming from working class uh, sectors didn't have a political action. So now I think this these two dimensions are more explicit in their discourses and so on. So yeah, something to explore, further explore in the future. I think we need two or three more hours here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If I see the questions in the chat, they are like, okay, we need a seminar. Yeah. I appreciate the reminder to all of us here in the US from you for the diversity of these two countries who are next to each other with total similar histories and stories, but also very diverse in the way social work has developed. And so the reminder for us living here is that uh, when we talk about the Latino population in the US is like, pff, there's no such thing. Uh, there's so much diversity, which I think we all know, but it's a good reminder. That, that that's the case. And, and, and I do think this conversation could go on for hours with some wine and empanadas. And um, that would be, Perfect, perfect. I'm real. I'm real. I, I want to thank you for your incredible presentations. There, there was one, one last question. I know it's almost seven o'clock. The last question uh, that if you could briefly mention, because as you're what you have talked about takes, as you described, courage, energy, all sort of things. I'm not going to repeat. But if there's an, a question about how do social workers in Argentina and Chile take care of their mental health. And I wonder if you can briefly provide an example or say they don't, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, be, and, and then after you, you both, uh, Janina and Melissa, both, both you respond, I'm going to just have a, a move on to close, closing our, our session today. But I thought that was an important question to, to hear your, your thoughts on that, please. We are so coordinated with, with Shani because we are friends. Of course, you have noticed that. <laughs> no? We are missing each other because we are not seen in person with wine and that stuff uh, for, for two years, almost two years. We are really expecting to have a plane and, and go and see the, the other. Uh, that's a plus for us to be here sharing because we, we are great friends. Um, regarding the, the question, I, I think I can state that in Argentina, we don't care about our mental health. We are completely ex exploded and self-exploded. And no, it's, it's not a dimension that is considered or taken in consideration. Never. Maybe there have been some attempts from the uh, professional organizations to make, I don't know, some meetings to talk about this and how uh, social workers take care of themselves and talk about it. But 
it's not a, a regular practice. It's like an extraordinary thing when someone thinks that it's necessary to stop and think about ourselves, but it's not a, a regular practice here. It's not even a, a dimension. Uh, I think it's very relevant, but uh, unfortunately it's not uh, taken like this. I don't know in, in Chile, and I really don't know in mm. any place about that. Yes, in my, as, I, as, I, as far as I know, uh, it's not important as well. I think it's very important, but it's not something that uh, emerges when, when, when we talk about uh, social work practice. Um, in fact, in some points, I have seen a kind of... Um, professional resistance in terms of solidarity is in, in, in the literature about polit uh, professional resistance. This is a kind of productive resistance because it refers to those colleagues that support each other, sometimes um, in opposition of what the institution says. For example, I cover you when you go to look for your baby, and but we don't say anything to our manager, you know, that kind of, and this is self-care uh, for, for, and, 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 and uh, be careful with mental health. I support my colleague, but it's a very individual practice. No, it's not a, a, a something organized or, um, yeah, it's absolutely a spontaneous practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And there could be so much more conversation over this. Maybe another time in person over wine and empanadas. Um, I'd West. like to bring, I wanna thank you, both of you, Janina and Melissa, for your incredible presentation, uh, your, your depth of conceptual understanding, historical uh, context that serves to uh, provide very insightful presentations. And again, I want to say that your, 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 your English was tremendously and 100% and better than my Spanish, than what's left of my <laughs> Spanish. Entonces, muchas gracias. Realmente una presentación increíble. Se la agradezco muchísimo. I want to thank also our uh, reflectors, Catalina Tang and Roberto Orellana, for their time helping us today. And behind the scenes, our incredible uh, students providing tech support and helping organize the event, Laura Cohen and and Greer Hamilton, thank you both of you. And of course, Don Belke Martinez, she is the focus, the center that uh, helped us keep going. Uh, a reminder, if you're getting CEUs, please complete the form using the link that Lauren put in the chat. I saw it earlier, I think I saw it maybe a couple of times. So make sure you do that, please. And as we say, we'd like to say that the path to the path, if you can understand my English, the path to justice is more like a, marathon and not a sprint. Sprint, you burn out quickly and you stop. Marathon, you keep going, going, and going. Take good care of yourself and everyone. We need everyone to be as healthy as you can be physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, to be able to make the changes that we need to make uh, in our societies world, worldwide. We hope to see you at our, at our December um, Equity and Inclusion Speakers event, December Thursday the 16th, when Carolyn Cho will present on Asian American organizing, lessons in solidarity, community building, and organizing from the margins. Our president uh, of the alumni board, Dan Do, will moderate this session. Thank you, everyone, and I wish you a, a great rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.